Mr. Chair, yes. members of the Law and Justice Committee, good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Michael Heavey. I'm a retired King County Superior Court judge. I was on the bench for 12 years, three months, and 28 days, but who's counting? <laughs> yeah, okay. I thought then, and I still do, that it was the best job in the whole world. I presided over 200 jury trials, over 150 criminal jury trials, from drug possession to murder in the first degree. I sentenced over a thousand men and women to prison, some life without the possibility of parole. I entered law school in 1973, and over the years I came to believe that our justice system made mistakes, but those were usually corrected on appeal. That belief started changing for me in November of 2007. Amanda Knox was a neighbor girl of ours in West Seattle. She was a friend and classmate of my oldest daughter. For four years, they carpooled to Seattle Prep High School on the north end of Capitol Hill. On November 6, 2007, Amanda was arrested in Perugia, Italy. She was charged with sexual assault and murder of her roommate, Meredith Kircher. I offered my support to Amanda's family. I soon saw that she was innocent. There was no credible evidence against her. And that is exactly what the Supreme Court of Italy finally found in 2015. Amanda Knox and her co-defendant, Raffaele Solesito, are innocent. There is no evidence against them. Now, at first, I blamed the wrongful conviction on Italy. But then I started seeing that our country has more than its fair share of wrongful convictions. This will come as a surprise to no one, but life is a contact sport. <laughs> we all get hurt, we all get injured, we get rejected, disrespected, and insulted. But can you imagine being charged with a crime you did not commit, convicted by a jury of your peers, and then sentenced to a life in prison, maybe even put on death row? In the Bible it says, so you do unto the least, you do unto me. The wrongfully convicted are some of the most grievously injured people in our society, harmed and hurt not by some mean person, but by the very government that should protect them. In my opinion, they are the least among us. In the next 29 minutes, I'm going to tell you about the overwhelming number of wrongful convictions in this country. I will show you how they happen and explain concepts like corpus delicti rule, confirmation bias, and noble cause corruption. I will tell you how Judges for Justice help free an innocent man in Idaho and how you and each of us can help free innocent men and women. Sometimes shocking crimes are fake. They're made up. They didn't really happen. A prime example of this is 1692 in and around Salem Village, Massachusetts Bay Colony, 150 men and women were charged with being witches. Many were convicted. 20 were actually executed, hung. 15 women and five men. Why? Because they refused to confess to being a witch. If you, if you did say you were a witch, they spared you the death penalty, and you only went to prison. Good incentive to say you're a witch, I would think. Judge Learned Hand is a famous American judge. In 1923, he stated, our procedure has always been haunted by the ghost of the innocent man convicted. It is an unreal dream. Judge Hand was incorrect. 
The University of Michigan Law School maintains a website, the National Registry of Exonerations. As of June 1, 2017, there have been 2,032 exonerations since 1989 for serious felonies. 117 of these <coughs> exonerations had been on death row. In the last four years, there have been over 800 exonerations for serious felonies. They're now out walking the street, declared innocent by a court. Judges for Justice believes there are hundreds, maybe thousands, of innocent men and women still in prison, some on death row. This is unconscionable. It's a national disgrace. Frederick Douglass said, education means emancipation. We agree. Our website states, our mission is to provide independent, impartial, and experienced expert analysis of cases of alleged innocence. Let's take a look at the Chris Tapp case in Idaho. Two weeks after I retired, I traveled to Idaho Falls, Idaho. It's a 12-hour drive in eastern Idaho. I was there to meet with Chris Tapp's attorney and the victim's mother, Carol Dodge. I was there to look at the Chris Tapp conviction and the Angie Dodge murder. Timeline. <clears throat> Warning, the details are a little graphic. In the early morning hours of June 13, 1996, 18-year-old Angie Dodge yeah. was murdered and sexually assaulted. She had been stabbed 14 times, partially disrobed, male DNA was left. It appeared she had been killed in her sleep. Seven months later, on January 4th, 1997, a friend of Angie's by the name of Ben Hobbs was arrested in Ely, Nevada for rape. He had controlled his victim with a knife. From then on, he was the one and only suspect of the Idaho Falls Police Department. On January 7th, 1997, three days later, Chris Tapp is brought in for questioning. He's a friend of Ben Hobbs, and the police are hoping that he may implicate Ben in the crime. Three and a half weeks later, on January 30th, after nine interrogations and seven polygraphs, Tapp confessed to stabbing Angie. He stated that Ben Hobbs and a third man threatened to kill him unless he stabbed her. Based upon that confession, he is charged with murder in the first degree and rape. May of 1998, a jury convicts him of the crimes. The prosecution asks for the death penalty. December of 1998, the judge spared his life, sentenced him 30 years to life. Judges for justice experts include myself, a retired judge, Steve Moore, retired FBI supervisory special agent. He's our chief investigator of Judges for Justice. Greg McCrary, <coughs> McCrary, a retired FBI supervisory special agent. He has been involved in the investigation of violent crime for over 40 years. Greg McCrary is also a nationally recognized expert on false confessions. Dr. Charles Haunts is a Boise State University psychology professor and a nationally recognized expert on the polygraph. The TAP legal team consisted of John Thomas, his attorney, Dr. Greg Hampikian, Boise State University professor, DNA expert, and executive director of the Idaho Innocence Project. Law professor Steve Drizzen, Northwestern University Law School, is a nationally recognized expert on false confessions. Peter Neufeld and Vanessa Potkin of the New York Innocence Project. Peter Neufeld and Barry Sheck co-founded the original Innocence Project. There are a number of red flags, and the most prominent was that the victim's mother, Carol Dodge, who had believed for 13 years that Tapp was one of her daughter's killers, started investigating on her own. She soon started seeing there was no evidence to support his confession. She started to believe he just might be innocent. Now, Tapp's confession was really six statements, 
the first uh, over a three and a half week period. His first was, I don't know anything. Number six, I stabbed her with Ben Hobbs and the third man. <clears throat> but in his confession, he couldn't name the name of the third man. He didn't know where Angie lived. He didn't know the distinctive clothing she was wearing. Presumably, a person at a traumatic event would remember some of the details. It just didn't make sense. The male DNA at the scene didn't match Ben Hobbs or Chris Tapp. Subsequent sensitive DNA testing of hair at the crime, Angie's clothes, and hand swabs continued to show only one man present, the one who left the DNA. All these DNA tests excluded Ben Hobbs and Chris Tapp. Other concerns were the corpus delicti rule, FBI profiling, and a report from Canada on wrongful convictions. Let's look at the corpus delicti rule. It is a logical way to evaluate any witness statement. Corpus is Latin for body. Delecti is Latin for crime. Literally means body of the crime. In 1660, a man named William Harrison went missing. His personal effects were found by the side of the road. Suspicion fell on his servant, John Perry. After a week of questioning, John Perry confessed to killing Harrison and hiding his body. He also said that his mother, Joan Perry, and his brother, Richard Perry, assisted him with the murder. Based upon Perry's confession, all three were indicted, they went to trial, and they all three were found guilty by a jury. One week after the guilty verdicts, all three were hanged. The mother, <coughs> excuse me, Joan Perry was hanged first, then Richard, the brother, and then John Perry. It was done in that order to effect the maximum suffering on John Perry whom they saw as the ringleader. However, three years after the Perrys were hung, William Harrison returned to Gloucester, England, alive and well. Three people had been executed for a crime that never happened. Out of this case and others like it was developed the corpus delicti rule. Before a confession is admissible in a court of law, it must be corroborated. For example, does the confessor know something that only somebody at the crime would know? It is legal recognition that sometimes police coerce confessions. Using the logic of the rule, Chris Tapp's confession looks very unreliable. He doesn't know where Angie lived, the name of the third man, or the distinctive t-shirt she was wearing when she was murdered. FBI profiling. Since the late 1970s, the FBI has investigated, consulted on, or studied thousands of sexual homicides. They've interviewed these killers in prison. Why? Because they are one of the most, because a sexual homicide is one of the most horrific crimes a community can suffer. They are hard to solve because it's a stranger killing. The victim and the perpetrator are not friends. There is no traditional motive. They classify sexual homicides on a continuum from disorganized to organized. Your organized sexual homicide is your serial killer. Angie Dodge is a classic disorganized sexual homicide. The characteristics include a blitz-style blitz attack. The victim never sees it coming. Angie was asleep. The perpetrator lives in the neighborhood. He's a peeping Tom. He's been watching her uh, undress at night. He covets her. Most importantly, a, de a disorganized sexual homicide usually, if not always, is a single perpetrator.
Tapp's confession that three men were involved in the murder is not backed up by any study of violent crime. Now, <clears throat> Canada has a single federal system of prosecution. The United States has 3,143 counties or county equivalents. Each county has their own elected prosecutor. And when an American county prosecutor has a wrongful conviction, he or she's not particularly interested in trying to study how it happened or how we're going to prevent them in the future, because they're so rare. Now, in Canada, in the 1990s, they had three just gross miscarriages of justice. Three people were wrongfully convicted, and Canada said, that's unacceptable. We're going to study how they happened and how we can prevent them in the future. In 2004, Canada's Department of Justice, its Crown Prosecutors, issued its report on the prevention of miscarriages of justice. One of their conclusions, a leading cause of wrongful convictions in Canada and in other countries is tunnel vision and its perverse byproduct of noble cause corruption. Let's look first at tunnel vision. <clears throat> tunnel vision is also called confirmation bias. We all fall prey to it. When we as human beings have a problem and then we come to a solution, we form a subconscious bias for our solution. We look for evidence, no matter how remote, to confirm our bias, confirmation bias. We reject evidence that is inconsistent with our bias, no matter how probative that evidence might be. It is the reason scientific tests are conducted on a double-blind basis. Have you ever bought a new car and suddenly you see your new car everywhere, make, model, and color? It's a very benign form of confirmation bias. Uh, and you may not have even realized you were doing it until I pointed it out. When the underlying issue is emotional, like a horrific homicide, the confirmation bias, the tunnel vision, is absolutely blinding. The important takeaway, it's a subconscious force. The people involved cannot see that they are blinded by their bias. Let's look at noble cause corruption, a perverse byproduct of tunnel vision. The police and prosecutors, actually all of us, are on a noble cause. Let's get this deviant killer locked up and make our community safe. The police and prosecutors are convinced, because of their tunnel vision, that this defendant is a killer. So what if we cut a few corners? The end justifies the means. We know he's guilty. Noble cause corruption takes place, takes many forms, but it is always present in a wrongful conviction. Question, how do you get a conviction without any or very little credible evidence? The answer is you use the power tools of noble cause corruption. They include inflammatory media about the crime and the defendant's culpability. The defendant is convicted before they ever get to trial. Coercive interrogations of the defendant and other witnesses. Unreliable and dubious witnesses are used. Scientific evidence is often ignored and or manipulated. There is often official conduct, official misconduct. misconduct. So we investigated the Chris Tapp case. We identified it the confirmation bias the tunnel vision, the blinding tunnel vision, was Ben Hobbs killed Angie Dodge. There's no doubt about it. And we're going to build a case against Ben Hobbs. We also saw the power tools of noble cause corruption present. 
inflammatory media. By the time Cap Tap got to trial, he was already convicted. Dubious witnesses surfaced at trial. At trial, a woman by the name of Destiny Osborne said that she overheard at a party Tap confessing to the murder. Mm -hmm. Now, today, over 20 years later, she says she was coerced by the police into testifying against Tap. The DNA tests that didn't match either Tap or Hobbs were ignored. The prosecution failed to produce key evidence prior to trial to Tapp's trial attorneys. We saw Tapp's confession violated the corpus delecti rule. There's no corroboration. Logic, logic told us he didn't know the details because he wasn't there. FBI profiling told us that the killer lived in the neighborhood, he was a peeping Tom, and he didn't know Angie. But most of all, it told us that it was a single perpetrator, which matched, of course, the DNA evidence. After looking at Tapp's nine interrogations, and we saw that he told six separate and distinct stories over a three and a half week period. His first story was, I don't know anything, and his last one was, I stabbed her because they threatened to kill me unless I participated in the crime. So he made five changes. Why did he, we couldn't figure out why he did, why he kept changing his story. And then we saw, prior to each interrogation where he changed his story, he was giving, given a polygraph examination, an examination that his attorneys did not sit in on or observe. Our polygraph expert, Dr. Charles Hans, said that the polygraph was used as a psychological rubber hose to beat and coerce Tap into confessing. I'm going to show you a couple segments from the January 15, 1997 polygraph of Chris Tap. In this first one, very short, the police officer is telling Tap that the polygraph is saying he's at the crime with Ben, and Ben goes wacko and starts killing Angie Dodge. Uh, you're in this part. See him go wacko here. Yeah. And start basically killing him. You go wacked out and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You left. You left. You came back or not? I think you left the room at that time. You did a lot of him. Ten seconds later, a very emotional tap, his voice cracking, asks why he can't remember being at the crime. And then the police officer responds to his question by saying, Sometimes your subconscious can block it out. Your, sometimes your subconscious can block it out. That, by the way, is an absurd statement. We remember things that were traumatic. We don't remember things that were untraumatic. Most of us remember where we were when we heard that the 9-11 attacks on New York City. We remember traumatic events. And after he says that, he sums up the polygraph examination by saying, the charts are telling me, Chris, you're telling me, it's saying to me, you were there. On the charge you're telling me, it's saying to me, you were there. Two days later, Chris Tapp confesses to going to the scene of the crime with Ben Hobbs. Now, on March 22nd, 2017, it all came together for Chris Tapp. It was truly a team effort that got him out of prison. A bucket brigade of innocence for Chris Tapp. The judge released Chris Tapp. This is a picture of Chris Tapp, myself, and our Judges for Justice videographer, Faraz Zargami, on the steps of the Bonneville County Courthouse in Idaho Falls, Idaho. In the spring of 2016, an Idaho Falls grassroots organization had emerged. It was called 
Citizens for Justice for Chris Tapp. On September 22, 2016, there was a critical hearing on the Tapp case in the courthouse. When the judge drove in that morning, he saw 10, 10 of these citizens holding signs. You see five of them in the picture. When, he, when the judge walked into the courtroom, it was full, jam-packed. People had to be turned away. National news media was filming, NBC, CBS, stars. This was proof to us, this was evidence, that we had been successful. The confirmation bias that convicted Tapp had been reversed. Many people now believed he was innocent. Public opinion had changed. Now, on April 15, 2017, CBS show, 48 Hours, featured the Tapp case. It was entitled The DNA of a Killer. You can get it online or you can get it on demand. And it had a shot of our website, Judges for Justice. It generated 73-plus letters from prisoners all around the country. Those are some of the letters in the slide. We simply do not at this time have the staff to review and properly analyze these requests for help. We currently have five cases in review. Joe Martin, Tennessee. Charles Erickson, Missouri. Frank Pauline, Hawaii. Jeff Baker, Idaho. Kirsten Lobato, Nevada. All five were convicted of horrific murders, but all five appear to be innocent. Now, here's the approach we want to take on future cases, much like Chris Tapp case. First, identify them where a person appears to be innocent. Second, assign a team of volunteers to each case, maybe a retired judge, a lawyer, retired police investigator, anyone with a passion for justice. Third, Thoroughly review the case. Phase one is estimated to be $10,000 per case. Phase two, identify and bring in relevant experts, not paid for the defense, but, but by us, judges for justice. Ask the experts to give us their unbiased opinion. Next, we publish their expert reports on our website and engage the local media. We estimate the costs of phase two to be $20,000 per case. In phase three, we would create, this is something we did not do on the TAP case. We would create a comprehensive video of innocence. And we would then get as many people as possible to view this video, drive the message. We would support others in the innocent effort. Phase three, probably about $20,000 per case. Now, quick word about the comprehensive video of innocence. In TAP, we found that few people would read an expert report. But we had over 10,000 views of the three videos that we created on our website that explained the case. In future cases, we would create a comprehensive video that would discuss all the things that I've been talking about, the crime and the conviction, what the experts are finding, identify the tunnel vision, identify the power tools of noble cause corruption, possibly corpus delecti rule, FBI profiling, who knows. But we expect a discriminating viewer observing this video would leave would have the opinion, there's no doubt that this person is innocent. In this day and age, most people are a simple mouse click away from watching at any time of day, at work or at home, a comprehensive video of innocence. We simply have to take advantage of this ability to educate people. Now, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, does it make a sound? I don't know. But we do know that if no one watches that video of innocence, nothing's going to happen for the innocent person in prison. 
So we need to drive the message of innocence, much like a political candidate drives the message of his or her candidacy. Maybe TV and radio ads, newspaper ads, maybe direct mail. And hopefully, in the end, it turns out like this. That's a picture of Carol Dodge and Chris Tapp on the courthouse steps. Chris Tapp's fiercest enemy, Carol Dodge, the mother of Angie Dodge, turned out to be his most important friend and ally. Now, <clears throat> the civil rights movement took a multi-pronged approach to repealing and eradicating the Jim Crow laws of segregation. They had a lot of arrows in their quiver. Many individuals contributed, including Justice Thurgood Marshall, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Bernard Lafayette, Diane Nash, James Bevel, and tens and even hundreds more were part of this movement. A jury verdict is the law. In the case of a wrongful conviction, it is an unjust law. It is an institutionalized injustice, just like Jim Crow laws were institutionalized injustices. We believe that a multi-pronged attack on a wrongful conviction is also important. We see ourselves as a part of a bucket brigade for innocence. To win in court, it helps to win in the court of public opinion first. We use, in other words, we're going to reverse the process that got the person wrongfully convicted in the first place. We use impartial experts, not paid for by the defense. This enhances our credibility. We then educate the public, <clears throat> and education means emancipation. Dr. King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. In his 1963 letter from the Birmingham jail, he said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We need help. We need to hire a full-time administrator. We need volunteers, anyone with common sense and a passion for justice. If you're watching this presentation and you want to volunteer, write us at that address on the screen. We need funding. Please send us a check to the address on your screen, or you can contribute on our website at judgesforjustice.org. Mr. Chair, members of the King County Council Law and Justice Committee, on February 24th, 1986, the King County Council passed Motion 6461, deeming that King County shall be named after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Of the 3,143 counties in this United States of America, this county is the only one named after Dr. King. I respectfully submit that it would be fitting and proper for this county to lead the way and support innocent organizations like Judges for Justice. A wrongful conviction is one of the most grievous injustices and injuries that a person can, can, that can be perpetrated on a human being. They are the least among us. Do not be silent. An injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Please support us. Thank you so much for listening and giving me your time. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Okay, and we only have just about, at most, five minutes for questions, but I wanted to ask you, uh, I know of several cities I've been in where there are innocence projects, primarily run by uh, lawyers, uh, not by judges, that have been very helpful at helping those in those locales where they are represented uh, to create the kind of uh, information that you suggest is absolutely necessary to prove innocence. And sometimes they've been very successful. Uh, I had not heard of your, your organization until today. 
So why would we have people not support those kind of projects and instead give their money or their uh, help or dramatize the importance of judges for justice? Well, I don't think one is opposed to the other. We worked with the Idaho Innocence Project and the New York Innocence Project on the TAP case. Okay. We, I thought we worked well. Uh, and uh, we're not saying support us over those. Oh, they okay. all do great jobs. They, they've got limitations. A lot of times they're law students. They're there yeah. for, for a semester or a quarter, and then they're gone. Uh, <clears throat> they We get, and we found in the TAP case, part of the idea of this is just the credibility of retired judges, retired FBI supervisory special agents, that when we came in, you, um, gave expert reports and opinions, the press and then the public gave us tremendous credibility. When a, uh, uh, a lawyer says, my client's innocent, we've hired this expert, and this expert says, well, there's a little bit of skepticism sometimes on, mm. the, uh, on, on that. We come in as a supplement, as okay. a complement. We not do not represent of, the right. defendant. They represent the defendant. We come in as part of this bucket brigade, in, a, in essence, to help them, to assist them, and to, in a okay. way we hope we can put them over the top. We think we, got, we put them over the top on the tap. Yeah. Okay. They did great That's work. DNA uh, experts, uh, Idaho Innocence Project, they did great work, but I think they okay. would all say that we helped a lot. Okay, that's helpful. Do any of the committee members, Councilmember uh, Jenny Colwell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Judge Heavey, for your very you. moving presentation and all the work that you're doing. And I know in talking with you earlier that uh, we both know that the state of Washington did enact legislation, enact a new law to provide for compensation for those who are proven to be wrongfully convicted. And I'm proud of our state legislature for doing that. But that doesn't make up for all the ones that we have, that are still in prison. And of course, those who are executed or on, on death row. But on page 13 of your PowerPoint, uh, you told about how Canada had three wrongful con convictions that were found, and they have the philosophy of these being unacceptable, and, and three cases were found and rectified, I believe? Yeah, they, uh, well, hopefully, yeah, they were, they were rectified, and then there was just a public outrage. And one of the, the horrible, horrible things that happens to prosecutors and and law enforcement is when an, a wrongful conviction is exposed, and oftentimes because of, partially because of their bad conduct, they lose public respect. So you see a lot of police organizations <coughs> coming around and supporting studying wrongful convictions and how to prevent them, how to not get into tunnel vision. And on that same page, you have in the, our country that airplane fatalities are unacceptable. You didn't get to that item. But I'm just curious, was the comparison there to show that in our country we find something else is unacceptable but not wrongful convictions? Well, or what? I, uh, that's, we, don't, we haven't looked at it from a national point of view or a big picture point of view like we do look at airplane ac accidents. We look at that as a big picture. I'm sure Canada also looks at airplane accidents as, as uh, unacceptable. So I didn't really want to go there with that. Mm. that. But my point is, they have determined they're unacceptable, just like airplane accidents. Let's figure out how to prevent them. What's a checklist? And that their report that they issued is, uh, uh, God, it's a must reading. And, and they put a lot of double blind stuff into it to try to cut cut against uh, uh, the tunnel vision that overcomes police officers. Um, on this topic, uh, and this is my last question, I mostly have uh, believed that a lot of the innocents, a lot of the um, folks who are uh, convicted of heinous or crimes uh, are uh, people of color, mostly blacks, that are, are 
have been found guilty of killing or hurting whites, and sometimes it's not true. Have you guys seen anything in your research that suggests here in America, which is a, you know, uh, where implicit bias and structural racism is still, unfortunately, too much of a part of our criminal justice system, that that has a disproportionate impact in one way or another, or you just haven't looked at that? I, just from my observations, yes, it has a, has a disproportionality to African Americans. If you look at all the exonerees, and I, yeah. a vast, uh, the majority of them are, uh, are black. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is going on. Joe Martin, our Tennessee case, he's a black man. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to be looking, hopefully we can open this up to looking at almost every case of alleged innocence. Now, here's something okay. interesting. You hear people say, on TV. Well, everybody in prison says they're innocent. Yeah. That's not true. If you go to prisons like I have and like friends of mine have, nobody says that. They might say, my sentence was too long, the judge sent me in here, but I don't mean nobody. Yeah. Actually, Some very few that. continue to fight for their innocence. They, they've either pled guilty or they agree with the jury verdict that found them guilty. But there are lots of people who still say that they're innocent. But it's not everybody says they're innocent. No, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Do any other members have questions? Okay, Council Member uh, Joe McDermott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Judge Heavey, you, you really um, very well illustrated the flawed system in which we work. Um, and in your introduction, make, make clear that we have it, we hold it to the highest ideals, and then we don't deliver. Your presentation makes that very clear. Not wanting to get lost in the details, I did have two questions, if I could. Um, what is the liability for, um, for someone who has a role in a wrongful conviction? For instance, the clip you showed us of the polygraph um, administer, I was going to say expert, um, who, um, by your own statements today, is, is even using false statements about um, one's ability to remember traumatic events. And secondly, you're, you talk about building the video and the public case and kind of doing it backwards from how someone was convicted in the court of public opinion before the legal proceedings. What's the legal step to appeal or seek a, a, to overturn a wrongful conviction? Um, you file charges to convict somebody. Is there a known step and a consistent step in these over 3,000 jurisdictions to overturn a, overturn a wrongful conviction? Each, what happens in these cases is that all the appeals become exhausted. Now it's very difficult to get into a court, to an appellate court, to a federal court, usually a writ of habeas corpus, and there are certain things. Is there new evidence? Is there ineffective assistance of counsel? Uh, and right off the hand, I can't think of them, but generally that's the route. Now, what we're finding is that once you change public opinion, the reception that you get from the court is, because these appeals are made all the time, called generally called writs of habeas corpus. But uh, once you change the public opinion, and, they, and they, there's a packed courtroom, sign waivers, good things start happening, and, and judges become more. I found myself, and one reason I got interested in it, is that when I liked to defend it, I was subconsciously feeling good about him and kind of ruling in his favor. And when I didn't like the defendant, I was subconsciously not yeah, ruling in his favor. I admit that. And then I saw it. I said, I can't do this. I got to treat them both the same because what I feel doesn't matter. But when an appellate judge is looking at a wrongful conviction 20 years ago, there is a confirmation bias, a feeling of, one, they got it right, we don't get these things wrong, and two, he's guilty, and uh, we got to protect that jury verdict, we got to protect our system, we can't look bad. All those things, hopefully, when you change public opinion, you get more to a neutral, and now the appellate judges can look at it more from a neutral point of view instead of a subconscious. I know appellate judges don't like me saying that they're biased, 
but it's subconscious. We don't realize it when we're doing it. You've had an earlier discussion on implicit bias. Yeah. It's a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. All right, we're going to have to move on, uh, but I wanted to thank you, uh, Judge Heavey, thank you, on Mr. behalf Chair. of the committee thank for you being so with much. us. Really appreciate it. And those it. of us that are very interested in this effort will get back to you. Thank you. All right.